Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. What are you doing? You didn't even say spoiler alert. Spoiler alert? I haven't read that part yet. I don't want to know what happens. You're wrecking it for me, old dude. I don't understand. Why would you even be in church if you didn't know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? Yeah, 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 yeah. What is it now? I didn't know that. It's part of his origin story. That's like me telling you that Green Lantern got his ring from a dying alien who is from the Guardians of the Universe on a planet called... Oh my gosh, I can't even believe I just did that. I am so, so, so sorry. I don't think it matters. As people of faith, we're concerned with meaning. Not obsessed by how things end. So yes, little David killed Goliath with his slingshot, but... Nah, 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 my brain is on fire from disgusting forbidden spoiler knowledge. Please take a mind rake and scrape away what you just told me. Maybe you should think about stories in a different way. They're not just surprises. They can really nourish you. So if I came here every Sunday and listened to you and put money in the collection plate, would I go to heaven after I die? Telling you... Would be a spoiler. (laughs) Oh, good one. You really got me there. No, seriously. Tell me, please. Nope, I don't do spoilers. Well, I do. Kaiser Sose is... Today on the show, the epic problem of spoilers. And now he doesn't know that Hansel and Gretel get out. Colin McEnroe. Don't tell me that part. All right, so... So we're doing a show about spoilers, and I think one reason that I wanted to do a show about spoilers, I forget whose idea it was. I think it might might have been Stephanie Reef's idea, but one reason I said yes is I recently had this encounter with two people who listened to this radio show, well, who listened to this radio show because they told me they were never going to listen to this show again because in the course of a conversation with the actress Ileana Douglas, I, without really thinking, just kind of let drop how the movie Easy Rider ends. And, you know, the movie Easy Rider came out 45, or actually Dan Quist just told me 47 years ago. I've just, it's canonical, right? I mean, and, and then, so these people were really upset, and I did attempt to mollify them uh, via email. And, and at one point I said, you know, you may not believe this, but it's not even really important how it ends. I mean, it's really the whole, it, it wouldn't wreck anything, and the whole thing is about a different kind of thing besides how it ends. And that just made them matter. Because uh, <laughs> they they want to decide, you know. So maybe it's about control. Don't tell me it doesn't matter that you wrecked. You know, so that's what we're talking about today is the notion of spoilers. And so uh, let me tell you a little bit who's on, about who's on the show today. Uh, we've got all kinds of wonderful guests for you. Uh, Dan Coyce is a senior editor at Slate Magazine and a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and lots of other things as well. He hosts all kinds of podcasts, including do you still do Mom and Dad Are Fighting? That's still on, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Slate's and, parenting podcast. Yes, and then uh, frequently appears on these Slate spo- spoiler specials. And just a second, Ben Zimmer, who's the executive editor of Vocabulary.com and language columnist for The Wall Street Journal, is going to tell us a little bit about the word itself. We're also talking to our friend Linda Holmes, writer and editor of NPR's uh, entertainment and pop culture blog, Monkey C, host of, uh, host of the NPR Pop Culture Happy Hour. And a little bit later, we're actually going to talk to a professor of psychology who has researched the psychology of spoilers. Um, Dan, before we go to Ben, um, you know, you and I were just sort of talking as di- talking during mic checks, and I said you would be surprised, uh, or you, maybe you said I would be surprised at what people get upset about. So I just told you my example of what people get upset about, knowing the ending of Easy Rider. Um, I-, I assume from your tone at the time that you've run into this kind of thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great example especially because Easy Rider is literally about the journey. Yeah. It's about how the journey matters more than the destination. Like, that's the that's the theme of the movie. Right. So it's great that someone got really upset about knowing the destination. But, yeah, you get if you write about culture for a living, you get this all the time. You will get it about 25-year-old TV shows that people haven't watched yet. People will get angry at you um, if you tell them what happened at the end of Who Shot JR, or if you tell them that Buffy died at the end of season five, or if you tell them, you know, uh, who dies at the end of season one of The Wire, like people get really angry about things that are decades old and, and therefore in, in our speedy pop culture metabolism, you know, lifetimes ago. We should probably say that of necessity, I mean, there's no way to talk about spoilers without talking about spoilers. So 
you know, although we're not going to aggressively and maliciously and sadistically spoil things for you, like you will note that neither Dan nor I has told you this time how Easy Rider ends, that there will be some things that kind of trickle out there. A couple of them just just did. Uh, and, and that's sort of inevitable. And if you're still listening to us, that's because you've already figured out uh, you can you can handle the truth, uh, as Jack Nicholson would say. All right. So uh, spoiler. Spoiler. Oh my spoiler. God, I know. A huge moment nice. in that movie. <laughs> it was a big moment. All right. So um, Demi Moore says it. I'm sorry. I got it wrong. So um, Ben Zimmer's joining us now. As I said before, he is an expert on language. He has written uh, about the derivation uh, of this word, about the use of this word. Ben Zimmer is executive editor of Vocabulary.com, language columnist for The Wall Street Journal. So Ben Zimmer, first of all, if we were having, if I were having that conversation, say, 47 years ago when Easy Rider came out and somebody was mad at me for giving away the ending, they probably wouldn't have said you spoiled it or you did a spoiler or I mean, that wasn't really how that word was probably used at that time. And it wasn't the way you described that particular phenomenon. Uh, That's right. Um, You know, uh, people were giving away the endings for movies or books long before we had this term spoiler to describe that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you would just simply say, don't give away the ending. And in fact, uh, a famous example of that would be, uh, the movie Psycho, uh, in 1960, Alfred Hitchcock wanted his audiences to be spoiler free, but he didn't have that terminology yet. Um, and so there was a, there was a publicity around the movie and even, um, sort of, uh, Alfred Hitchcock on film telling the moviegoers, please don't give away the ending. It's the only one we have. So that would typically be the way that you would talk about it um, until uh, the 1970s when that term spoiler starts, first starts cropping up. You know, um, I'm going to switch over to Linda Holmes for a quick second here. Even the thing that Hitchcock says isn't always true, right, Linda Holmes? We know of lots of occasions where filmmakers have shot multiple endings of things and or shot one ending and had the studio kick it back. I'm, I mean, one thing we have to accept that is that if Mortimer dies by, you know, snake bite at the end of movie X, it, that doesn't happen in some kind of platonic realm. It's just like one of the endings that they figured out. Well, exactly. In a lot of ways, when you talk about a spoiler, you're just talking about what, you know, what ending, as you say, what ending they they picked. It's not something that really happened. So, um, I I mean, I think I think that's that's absolutely true. They could have made different decisions in Psycho. They could have made different decisions in Easy Rider. And so. So, yeah, I mean, you have to see them as as uh, the information you're really getting is about the the creative decisions that the people who made the thing, you know, came up with. Yeah, no, I'm, I, my understanding is they shot one ending where Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda open up a motorcycle shop at the end, and they were going to spin it off into a sitcom, uh, and it just didn't really take. So Ben Zimmer, words are loaded up, and phrases and usages like this are loaded up with stuff. So give away the ending is one thing. Don't tell me what happens is another thing. But spoil, I mean, there's a lot of um, value uh, and 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 assumptions l- layered on to the notion of spoil, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, and and you know, the word spoil, obviously, and spoiler, ha- they have these long histories that predating our our use about you know giving away the endings of things. So a spoiler um, historically would just be a competitor of some sort that uh, that uh, spoils the chances of a front runner. We find that in sports and in politics. Just someone or something that messes things up, messes up the situation. But it wasn't until uh, 1971 in the Harvard Lampoon when Doug Kenny, who was one of the founders of the Harvard Lampoon, used this word spoiler specifically to talk about giving away the endings of (laughs) movies and and books and so forth, that that term got applied in that specific way. And this was this kind of uh, malicious thing that uh, Doug Kenny did for the Harvard Lampoon, where he was presenting it as a public service that uh, he was, you know, going to save you all of this uh, time um, for, you know, reading books or seeing movies by giving away the endings for every, you know, every important thing that has a twist of some sort at the end, from uh, Citizen Kane and Psycho to um, Agatha Christie books, just gave away everything in one big feature, um, a, a supposedly as a public service. And he called those spoilers. And, that, and it really took off from there. It, it sort of germinated through the 1970s, especially in the science fiction fan community, and then eventually online with Usenet news groups. 
And, uh, you know, now, of course, everybody's familiar with the term. And, and Dan Coyce, but that's a judgment. Something that is spoiled cannot be used, right? The, the, something that in other contexts, if you spoiled something, it's unusable, which to right. your point right. about, yeah. about Easy Rider isn't necessarily true. Right. So, like, if you have a, a cup of yogurt that's spoiled, a tiny little bit of it isn't spoiled, but you could eat around the rest. People who really have spoiler anxiety feel that if you know this one particular part of the movie, the ending or the twist, or even in some cases the setup, uh, the entire experience is now spoiled. It is ruined for them and could never be as pleasurable as it otherwise would be. Um, just jotting a little note to myself, never eat yogurt at Dan's house. Okay, here we go. Um, and uh, and so, uh, Ben Zimmer, there's sort of another thing that's gone on. I, I, until I read your column, I wasn't aware of it, which is now there's sort of um, uh, a, a sort of a, a subject-object uh, transposition here because now the phrase is, uh, I, uh, I've spoiled you. If I right. tell you the ending of something, I've spoiled you. And that's not quite right, but that is, in fact, the, the, the idiom. Yeah, it's interesting just to see how that verb spoil has changed as people have become more familiar with the idea of spoilers. So, yeah, originally um, you would just say, oh, you spoiled the ending of that movie. Um, but, uh, but eventually the person uh, who re- receives that unwanted information could become the object of the verb. Like, um, I'm sorry you got spoiled, uh, meaning that, you know, um, the information was revealed to you, the twist ending or whatever. Um, And so the person is getting spoiled. That's an an interesting extension of this where, you know, you haven't just spoiled the experience, but the person has become spoiled. It's like it's like uh, uh, almost as if. Uh, this experience has wrecked you to your soul. Right. There used to be a phrase, you know, a person could be ruined by a book, but that was you read the whole book and it had such a profound effect on you that you were a different person. But this is uh, this seems a little hysterical. This particular you have spoiled me. Um, well, Ben Zimmer, I feel as though we're on sound lexicographic footing uh, as we go through the rest of our our journey here through the world of spoilers. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to do a very quick break. We're going to come back with more of Linda Holmes, more of Dan Coyce. George gunned down Gatsby before taking his own life. The chief is a silent she can sell the ninja clad. And Carmen's mom is also his dad. Jack and Tyler Dirk. We're talking about spoilers with Linda Holmes and Dan Coyce. You know, sometimes it really does hurt to have something spoiled for you. I I get that. I totally understand that. Uh, One of the great examples uh, of this, this won't spoil anything for you. Um, Just don't worry. Uh, There's a terrific uh, comedy series on decades ago with Dabney Coleman called Buffalo Bill. It was kind of about Bill O'Reilly before there was a Bill O'Reilly. It was about this completely heartless, self-involved local TV uh, talk show host. Uh, And one entire episode, as I recall it anyway, involved Bill trying to get somebody to go have dinner with him or uh, hang out with him uh, some evening. And because he had been so horrible to everybody at the station, that was very nearly impossible. So uh, here we uh, we hear him here uh, approach a guy he barely knows at all, a guy from the cl- from the crew whose name is Stan, uh, asking Stan if uh, Stan, who's working there in the studio, would be willing to go out to dinner with him, with Bill. I worry about you sometimes, buddy. Call me sensitive, but I always... And I thought of you as a, a lonely kind of guy. No problem there, but I got lots of friends. Good. You, um, you gonna be with them tonight or what? No, tonight I'm gonna watch the Sabres play the Penguins. Penguins? Huh. Well, that was three nights ago, wasn't it? I know, I got it on videotape. Oh. I wouldn't let anybody tell me the results, so it's gonna be a complete surprise to me. Sabres lost. <laughs> In four to three. So, uh, what do you think, Stan? Would you like to go out and get a bite to eat with me tonight instead? No. Buying? No. Quarter pounders? No. Dull game, Stan. Except for Perot's hat trick. All right, so that's malicious uh, spoiling. And so, Linda Holmes, what we've kind of run into these days are, and I think you call them spoiler phobes, uh, Linda, uh, people who kind of regard any little trickle of information about anything as having that kind of epic and almost aggressive, assaultive scale for them. 
Right. I think one of the things that happens with spoilers is that it's one of the few places where we are still required to kind of to come up with a definition of public courtesy. And I think for a lot of people, reliance on public courtesy is something that is very hard for them, both because if you're going to rely on courtesy, you're occasionally not going to get exactly what you want. And part of what to be people being courteous to each other often is, is understanding that they may have different definitions. And sometimes you may find out a little more than you wanted to know and all that kind of stuff as a consequence of kind of being out in the world. And all, but also they find that difficult because um, there aren't clear rules. And so, you know, Dan, I think Dan is somebody who has, who has tried to come up with kind of very, um, very bright line rules about what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and I think that's what people want because it's very uncomfortable to think of it as in the way that I, that I ideally prefer to think of it, which is just try not to do things that are, that are thoughtless toward other people. <laughs> And that that's different from trying to come up with an incredibly strict mechanism for for handling all this stuff. Well, Dan Coyes, let's just say that you did happen to come up with some bright line rules about what's right and what's wrong. What what would those be? Uh, well, they would, of course, be the official statutes of limitations on spoilers, yeah. uh, which I wrote now like eight years ago, I think, uh, for Vulture, New York Magazine's culture blog. Um and I tried to sort of come up with, well, okay, it's hard sometimes to remember when someone might be okay with you saying something about what happened on their favorite show. But it's also hard to be a person who wants to talk about television with your friends and with people on social media and people in the workplace and feel like you're constantly constrained by the fact that other people haven't watched that show yet, that they're time delaying or time shifting and haven't gotten around to it. So I did indeed try to come up with uh, what some rules could be for talking or writing about pop culture and especially TV shows with big surprises. This was in the year of Lost, particularly when spoilers were a real issue. Um, though it turned out in the end, spoiler, nothing <laughs> happened. Um, but so I came, I really did try and come up with these bright line things. And I think Linda understood at the time and understands now that it was a slightly quixotic quest and a slightly tongue-in-cheek attempt to do this, but it was a real attempt to grapple with the fact that uh, that people who are extremely sensitive about spoilers long past their air date can really take the air out of a fun, an otherwise fun conversation about pop, about pop culture. Um, so, um, well, I, you know, and I'm wondering, maybe we can even come back to, I don't know whether it makes sense to, to lay out what those rules are, but uh, maybe we can allude to them as we go along here. But Linda Holmes, I, I feel like the hysteria about this has been ratcheted up and, and some, and there's some reasons to which Dan has just alluded. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of them is that we time shift. In other words, when somebody, I won't say who died on the TV series, MASH, well, everybody watched MASH at the same time on the same night. So when that character got killed, Killed off, you know. Everybody knew it at pretty much the same. I mean, there was just you couldn't really spoil it for anybody. I mean, everybody kind of knew about that. So one problem is, yeah, we don't wa- watch stuff at the same time. But I'm also wondering, Linda, whether or not you know serialized television has gotten a little bit more daring in general. I could count on one hand the interesting characters who died in the middle of series. You know, in in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, it just wasn't really done that much. But now, if you're watching something like you know the American Americans or Game of Thrones or something, you know, there's a you, there's a core group of people you're pretty sure aren't going to die, but everybody else is potentially cannon fodder. So really, you know, uprooting things do happen. And, and maybe that's one of the reasons people are getting more freaky about it. I think that's one reason. I mean, certainly there are serialized shows that rely heavily on, on major shockers. <laughs> But honestly, I think the other reason relates to something else that I've noticed that maybe Dan's noticed too, which is that as people become more um, become more obsessed with kind of curating their own content and getting everything kind of on demand and by algorithm, and you only see the stuff that you kind of want to see, I think people have a harder and harder time uh, orienting themselves around the idea that you are one part. You are one reader of somebody's output that has many, many readers that want different things. So it's more and more common for me to essentially get feedback from people that say, I don't understand why you would write about this. I'm not interested in it. And it's hard to explain to people, 
you get that like everyone experiences that, right? Because I, I can't write only things that one person's interested in. I think the analogy to spoilers is it's harder and harder sometimes for people to understand Right. I get that you may not have seen this thing that was 30 years ago, but the conversation is still happening. And it's not your your on the on demand nature of what you're reading and watching and listening to does not extend so far as that it can actually be individualized at that level without denying a bunch of other people conversations that, as Dan said, they want to have. Well, yeah, that's totally true. I think that's totally true that right now people view the pop culture universe and the universe of people writing about it as specifically and personally delivered to them according to their whim. <laughs> and anything that upsets their whim is very annoying to them. And there's just there's just more stuff in general. I mean, look, if you lived uh, in a place where there are no snakes, like Finland, let's say there's no snakes in Finland, you wouldn't probably let's have... Say. You would, let's say it, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't be have... You'd be less likely to develop a phobia of snakes. They're just not around. I mean, there's just so much information right now and so much delivery systems, so many delivery systems. I mean, it really is very easy to be crucial using Twitter and find out something that you really kind of didn't want to find out. And since you're watching a bunch of different shows and interested in a bunch of different movies, I mean, we live in this incredible age of plenty with multiple channels and and and, and lots of other things that we can get involved in. It, it just seems like it's going to happen more often anyway. And so the tripwires are there and people uh, kind of lose it. I don't know. Dan, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's two different things you're saying here. One is that we live in a plenty of content, right? There are so many more television shows than there were, you know, when MASH was on the air. Um, and so we live in this era of peak TV. It's a glut of TV. It's a glut of movies and other and podcasts now. You can even spoil podcasts. and People get upset about that. And so it's harder to keep up with all of it, to keep up with the things that you care most about. So you're more likely to be behind. And then also, there are all these different ways that information can reach us. And so if you are not caught up on a show and you're trying to avoid spoilers, once upon a time, you know, you recorded that show on your VCR and you really wanted to see that Sabres game and all you had to do was make sure no one talked to you about it and you didn't look at the newspaper. That was it. Now, that guy on Buffalo Bill, you know, he has not only his jerk of a boss who's just kind of telling him that, but he has Twitter, he has Facebook, he has drive time radio, he has moving billboards as he walks past his local bank that give him news briefs. This stuff can come at him from anywhere, and I'm sure he feels at siege now in this universe of people who just want to spoil the Sabres game. Yeah. Boy, podcast spoilers. This week on uh, on uh, Political Gab Fest, apparently Emily and Platts really get into it. I mean, they're like really uh, yelling. Believe it or not, Platts said something crazy. <laughs> All right. Okay, we really wrecked that for people. You know, um, Linda, we're coming up on a break here, but, um, uh, you know, one, one thing we have to also ask ourselves is, What's a spoiler anyway? I mean, a spoiler is like there's a couple of different kinds of spoilers. Somebody dies or there's a big reveal. All right. Knowing who Kaiser says is knowing a certain urological fact about the crying game, maybe knowing what uh, what Rosebud is. You know, those are big reveals of a sort. But I mean, there are people who treat everything as a spoiler, as you pointed out in one of your pieces, like knowing that maybe somebody's sister is going to show up next episode on Friends or something, that that's a spoiler. Right. I I think that's the other thing that's extraordinarily difficult about this is reaching agreement about what kind of information we're talking about, because it's impossible to have it be absolutely any information unless you're going to shut down every conversation. And we can talk about this more, but even the idea of creating warnings is incredibly complicated um, and, and creates spoiler problems of its own in a bizarre way. So, yeah, it's there are people for whom if you say this person is joining the cast of a show, they think that's a spoiler. And you can't and you can't write about that or put it in a headline or whatever. Yeah, even if the show doesn't even exist yet, people will yell at you about casting decisions on shows that are just starting to film. And and yet, well, I mean, there's so many things to say about that. And it certainly is true that if you're I, I just sort of wonder. I mean, there was this article about Jonathan Franzen a few books ago about how he was like, you know, sitting in this room with his eyes taped shut and his ears stoppered up. And it was because he was trying to write this novel completely devoid of any kind of cultural input. But like, you, you know, I mean, how how can these people even live? I mean, the sterility, like if they don't want to know who's going to be in the cast of a movie that hasn't even been made yet. You know, I mean, it's like being it's like having some immune, immune disorder where you you can't go out. 
Well, I think in a lot of ways they don't actually want to live in a world where they don't know anything. They want to live in a world where they're told things and they constantly complain about it in some cases. <laughs> ah, I, I think you might be onto something. In some cases. In some cases. Right. Don't email me. Yeah. Um, we're going to take, take a, a break here pretty soon, um, and maybe I'll just sort of talk into it. Uh, I should say that both Linda, I think both Linda and Dan are coming back after the break. There's going to be a very short, it's public radio, we know about this, very short little fundraising break. Linda Holmes is with us, uh, writes and edits NPR's entertainment and pop culture uh, blog, Monkey C, host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. Dan Coyce is like the king of all media. I'm going to be here all day trying to explain the stuff that he does, but senior editor at Slate Magazine, magazine contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine, editor of At Length, an online magazine of writing, music, and art, and a bunch of podcasts, too, like Mom and Dad Are Fighting. Uh, I do want to say as we're going in here to the break, if you like this kind of thing, if this kind of thing makes you happy, um, if you, you know, if you, of course, a lot of you are not listening anymore at all because we're talking about these things, but let's say the few of you, the eight, the eight or ten of you are still like clustered around your radios, um, please, when we're doing the little pledge thing here, this is a great time for you to pledge. Uh, our show gets a little credit, uh, a little affirmation, a little credibility with the people upstairs who cannot figure out most of the time what in the world this show is. So uh, when they ask you to call in and make a pledge or go online and make a pledge, think about doing it right now if, in fact, the craziness that we oversee here is something that you relish and cherish. Even in a disguise, Ned Stark gets deaded. He gets quite beheaded. It looks like his... Today's show was produced by Stephanie Reef and Betsy Kaplan, who drive off a cliff together at the end, and by me, Kaiser Sose. Greg Hill and his sled Rosebud appeared in the intro, and he tweets for us at WNPR Colin. The part of Bill Curry was played by Dennis Hopper. For show pages, articles, and videos of the Here and Now staff acting out the plot twist in the crying game, go to our website, wnpr.org slash Colin. On tomorrow's show, the nose gets sexy for money. And now... Back to Colin. Yes, tomorrow in the news, we're going to talk about the new series, The Girlfriend Experience. We're also going to talk, I think, about Clive James's, and talk about spoilers, Clive James's amazing essay in The New Yorker about binge-watching Game of Thrones while he's in the grip of a very terrible disease. It's, a, it's, a, it's an essay like a few others. But uh, anyway, uh, that's tomorrow. Today we're talking about spoilers. Uh, Dan Coyce is with a senior editor at Slate Magazine, a uh, contributing writer at The New York Times, and uh, sometimes appears on the Slate Spoiler Special, where they talk about things for people who've already seen those things. I think that's uh, a fair way to say it. Now, Linda Holmes is the writer and editor of NPR's entertainment and pop culture blog, Monkey C, and the host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. You're about to meet uh, somebody who, um, who studies spoilers, who has studied spoilers, and the people who are spoiled by them or, or, or something, uh, however we, we're going to phrase that. Uh, before, before we uh, go to, uh, to him, though, I want to get you reacquainted with our two guests. And so, um, Dan Coyce, I'm going to start with you. One... Um, one thing that we have to acknowledge is not everybody's temperament is the same about this. And so, uh, for example, the woman I live with, that's her Pequot name, um, she, she wants to know things that are going to happen. When we were first watching Game of Thrones together, I had already seen Game of Thrones. I knew things that would happen. She's also very, very good at sussing out at almost a game theory level what is going to happen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, like after 20 minutes of watching the first episode of Game of Thrones, she looks at me and goes, is Ned Stark going to die? Are they going to kill Ned Stark? And I, I say, you know, just as a moral thing, I'm not going to tell you that. I refuse to, to cooperate, even with your sickening thirst for spoilers. Uh, and she said, it's gonna, you better tell me right now. You better tell me if he's going to die. So, and, and she actually is the kind of person who will zapruder the next week's coming attraction thing at the end of Better Call Saul to see if she can figure out what's going on. I mean, Dan, some people really want to know what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, well, not to spoil anything, obviously, but boy, she is good. She <laughs> is good. Uh, yeah, some people, that increases their... Uh, enjoyment of a movie or a TV show. In fact, many studies have shown that, in fact, knowing the developments of a plot before you watch something or read something actually tend to make you enjoy the thing more because you start to enjoy it on something other than a surface surprise and plot-based level, right? You start to enjoy the way something is constructed. You enjoy sussing out those clues ahead of time and seeing how they matter. And, I mean, I do want to point out also that that there there are plenty of shows for which uh, you totally, everyone knows what's going to happen. A great example is one of the best shows that has aired this winter, the, well, the most popular buzzy thing that's been on TV all year so far, which is The People versus O.J. Simpson. 
That's a show where literally everyone, let's say over the age of 30, who watched that show had a pretty good understanding of how everything was going to turn out. And pretty much everyone knew the ending. But it didn't matter at all to our enjoyment. It didn't matter. Even though there were surprises and twists, they were still just as enjoyable because you remember, dimly recalled that those things were going to happen. Um, yeah, there are, by the way, um, there's a small industry in trying to tell you things in advance. I think there's something called Spoiler TV where you can find out things that you're really kind of not supposed to know. There's also apps you can get that will block out spoilers from your social media experience if you program them, I think, for the things that you uh, care very much about. But Linda Holmes, another thing that's happening creatively is, you know, I mean, the people who create these products, they're, they're sort of aware of what's happening. So you have things like these kind of cliffhanger endings where uh, – in fact, they can't be spoiled. I mean, for example, at the end of this season's Walking Dead, and I'm not going to expo- spoil anything, it is clear absolutely that the last thing you see is someone being killed. Right. But, but they're not going to tell you who uh, you're going to have to endure weeks and months of agony. Right. And, you know, one of the things that they have done um, on uh, Survivor to, switch a, to, to sort of switch gears is they used to um, shoot the very end of Survivor where they found out who won the million dollars at the same time that they shot the rest of the show. They did it in the first season, I'm quite sure, and then I forget whether it was a second or shortly thereafter. Now they don't even reveal to the people there who won until they do a live finale when the show actually airs. So, And there are still people who know. I mean, they can still figure it out, but the idea is to try to reduce the possibility that it's going to get spoiled by not even shooting it until you're airing it. And so they are. there has been an effort to come up with ways to create things that can't be spoiled or that are harder to spoil, but ultimately, you know, I mean, if you set up a show that's got a crime where somebody did it, there's an X number of people who did it. Somebody on the Internet (laughs) is going to have come up with what the thing is anyway, it's it's you know it's not it's not rocket science in most cases to figure out what the possible endings are of a of most television shows. Well, well, that's a very clever move by those shows, right? Mm-hmm. Because they're treating the end of their show less like a narrative device that you might hold on to and wait to see for several days or weeks, and they're treating it like a sporting event. They're right. treating it like a thing you have to experience live because. It has that air of immediacy and excitement, and that's a that's a great reminder to people that if you don't want to be spoiled, treat the things you love like sporting events. Uh-huh. Just watch them when they happen. That's exactly how I felt about Allison Williams as Peter Pan. But anyway, um, w- this is public radio. We've got to have a, a double-blind, peer-reviewed study of this. Uh, Nicholas Christenfeld is joining us right now, professor of psychology at the University of California at San Diego. So, you know, Nicholas Christenfeld, as, at some level, we know this is all crazy. That we know that, you know, at, at a, a first run screening uh, of any of the Lord of the Rings movies, you know, out of 200 people, 198 of them knew every single thing that was going to happen. They'd read the books three or four times. Uh, they, they were aware at times whether the dialogue deviated slightly from the syntax of, of Tolkien. And these people are absolutely wrapped. They're enjoying this thing. The fact that they don't know, that they, that they do know everything that's going to happen hasn't dampened their pleasure at all. So um, we knew that intuitively. You know it more empirically. You actually tried to test that question. Tell us what you did. Well, I think your, your point is a fascinating one, that the vast majority of people say they loathe spoilers. Uh, spoilers are the bane of every critic's life at the moment you reveal even one tiny detail, like the casting of the show for the next season, which reveals who didn't die. Uh, they get 10,000 angry emails. Uh, and and my own research generated a, a, quite a bit of heat with people telling me uh, 10,000 reasons that my research was ludicrously wrong. Uh, and on the other hand, everybody really knows that it's true. Right? I mean, the examples your other guests gave are, are good ones, and, and there are lots of those. No one goes to see Hamlet thinking like, oh, I hope it works out on the Tia Ophelia are married at the end. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and some of Shakespeare plays even tell you in the title, like all's well that ends well, or a comedy of errors, like, oh, there are some mistakes, but it ends happily. I mean, you know the comedies, they end up married, and in the tragedies, they all, all end up um, dying in a pool with their own blood. Uh, and, and it doesn't ruin anything. Uh, and you even get plays you know, like Oedipus, where not only does the audience know how it's going to end, even the main character knows how it's going to end, and none of that spoils the drama. 
uh, you know, and people who generate this hostility towards the, the concept of spoilers, I ask them, you know, so the second time you watched uh, a, a movie that de- relies on some critical plot twist like Usual Suspects, did you enjoy it? They say, oh, I love rewatching that movie. Oh, there you go. So uh, in 2011, you, yeah, was, you was actually, actually, yeah, go ahead. Explain uh, what, what you did to test this. To have people read stories. And we picked various different kinds of stories. We sort of more literary stories, John Updike type things, uh, and then murder mystery stories where it all really hinges on the, the reveal at the end. And then also these sort of ironic twist stories like Shirley Jackson's lottery story where the, the final moment transforms the entire action of the play retroactively. And we thought at least in those last two kinds of stories, spoilers have a chance of actually spoiling stuff. And so we had people read these stories. They hadn't read them before, either as they're originally written or with us providing a tiny incidental spoiler at the beginning. Like, now you'll read a story where at the end it's discovered that you know, the lottery is to see who will be stoned to death. Uh, and then people read them and report how much pleasure they got from the reading experience. We should say that's the plot of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Exactly. Uh, anyway, continue. Right. Well, I mean, the, the argument here is we don't have to worry about spoiling stuff for people. Right. We can tell them who Rosebud is and everything. Uh, and, and the finding was not only do spoilers not spoil stuff, they actually enhance the experience, that people liked it more when it was spoiled. <laughs> and did you ever try to figure out why that was? Why, why would it be that people would actually would deepen their enjoyment? Yeah, so we looked at it, and there, turned out there are a couple of reasons. And, and one is... Uh, this argument that basically the plot is just an excuse for the artistry. You know, that when you go to see a ballet, you're not thinking, I go there to discover, you know, whether the swan dies. You know, like, that, that's not why you go. You go there to see the, the beauty, the, the art. Or, you know, and when you look at a Monet painting, you don't think, like, God, I wonder what happens to the water lilies at the end. Like that, there's no plot, right? It's just, it's just beautiful or, or profound or, or insightful or deep in some way. Uh, and that movies and even TV shows can do the same thing, or short stories, novels, etc. Uh, and that essentially knowing the plot enables you to free your mind to focus on the things that actually matter. And that a plot is like a coat hanger for displaying a garment. Without it, the garment is just a, a rumpled heap on the floor. Uh, and with it, you can see the beauty of the garment, but, but you don't think, like, the coat hanger is the critical thing that <laughs> you'd, you'd like to to get past the coat hanger and, and look at the rest of it. That's a beautiful image. So I want to go back to our other guest for a second. So I think he's saying it so beautifully, uh, Dan Coyce and, and Linda Holmes. But, Dan, you know, this is a, not something about which people are especially rational. For example, well, we had a situation where one of the guests on the show let slip kind of how The Revenant ends. And and Nicholas Christenfeld's point of, is perfect about The Revenant. You know, knowing how The Revenant ends is absolutely inconsequential it's all about watching this stuff unfold. It's all, and in fact, having that pressure taken off, you can really enjoy the eight or nine things about The Revenant that are really more important than how it ends. But you, people, people want what they want, in the words of Woody Allen. Sure, but that doesn't mean that people who want they, what they want have the right to wreck the fun of conversation for the rest of us. Spoiler Phobia is not a problem when you, you know, stay in your room covered up like Jonathan Franzen and don't bother other people with it. Spoiler phobia is a problem when you come out of that room and shout at everyone else who's having a great conversation about a thing that happened on TV a week ago because you haven't watched it and you shut down that conversation like a jerk because you haven't gotten around to watching it. So, um, so Linda Holmes, um, you know, sort of back to that idea. I mean, I know that your your whole philosophy, as you explained before, is kind of a thumbnail. Don't be the kind of jerk that Dan Coyce just described. Also, don't be the kind of jerk that Dabney Coleman plays in Buffalo Bill, aggressively ruining things. Is that is that going to be enough? Is there enough? Is there a happy enough valley uh, in the middle there where you know people can can talk about what they want to talk about? I mean, I think there's never a happy enough valley where nobody will complain. Um, That is an Internet fantasy that none of us will ever realize, no matter how advanced the Internet becomes. Um, But I do think, I mean, I think Dan and I would agree, for example, you know, you're not going to watch a show and the minute that it ends, put out a story with a headline that says, hey, wow, what about the fact that so-and-so died? Like, Dan would not do that and I would not do that because that's just 
inconsiderate. There's no reason to do that, and it's inconsiderate. But that doesn't mean you wouldn't post a piece about it, and it wouldn't mean that you would get yourself overly wound up about saying, oh, by the way, this piece I wrote about this show tells you what happens on this show, because you should assume that. So, yeah, there's a, I think there is a middle ground where most people feel okay about it, and more to the point, people feel okay about the fact that they don't get their way all the time. That's more important than feeling okay about how much, about how much spoiling you do or don't get is – being okay with the fact that the constant, that conversations cannot be tailored specifically to you in every instance. Uh, we're going to have to stop there. I do have one piece of happy news, which is as you get older, this becomes less of a problem. Uh, I was watching Mel Brooks, who's in his 90s. He and Carl Reiner get together every day and watch television. I, first of all, love that idea. He said, you know, mostly we like to watch those Born Identity movies because, you know, we forget what happens. He goes, I turn to Carl and go, Carl, I think he gets out of it this time. So, and I'm finding that too as I age. I don't remember how the Nightcrawler ended. I just remember Jake Gyllenhaal, Gyllenhaal being really, really skinny. All right, thanks to everybody, especially Stephanie Reef, who did this whole show. Run it for the rest of us. Greg, I am so excited about this fundraiser. We're about to raise. Bup, 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 bup. Spoilers! I don't want to know how much money we're about to raise. Okay, well, um, people can get my voice on their. Da, 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 da. Your voice on their, what, car horn? Who knows? Am I right? People may also choose a tote. A totally awesome mechanical. It's a tote bag, Greg. A tote bag.